From London, the National Broadcasting Company presents War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. War Telescope features John McVean of NBC's London staff, a veteran reporter of the European scene. For his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is John McVean in London. A huge force of American fortresses and liberators flew out from Britain today to strike at targets in southern Germany. It stated that they were escorted by fighters in very great strength. Among the objectives bombed were aircraft plants, airfields, and other war industries. It's probable that today's flight was one of the Americans' deepest penetrations into Germany and thought that nearly 2,000 planes, possibly half of them fighters, took part in this great attack. On Wednesday, March 15, 1944, during battle, the Allies dropped nearly 1,000 tons of bombs and 200,000 rounds of artillery on the Monte Cassino Monastery while trying to storm the building. They were unable to dislodge the Germans. The Allies were having more success in sinking submarines. Over the next 48 hours, Allied forces sank one Japanese and three German subs. On Thursday, at a National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics seminar in Washington, D.C., NACA personnel suggested a jet-propelled airplane be developed. On Friday the 17th, Mount Vesuvius erupted, destroying nearly 90 American aircraft and displacing 12,000 Italians, while Soviet forces took Dubno and Zmyrinka. The Soviets were set to begin their third Narva offensive on Saturday, as German soldiers began massacring people in both Romania and Italy. The Germans were facing heavy bombing at home, and all of Europe knew an Allied invasion was coming. On Saturday, March 18th, NBC's War Telescope took to the air over WEAF in New York at 1.45 p.m. Britain is in a period of waiting just now. You might almost compare it to the minutes just before a horse race when people look over the runners and make last minute bets. Little things that happen in those last minutes are regarded for their effect on the race. If a cloud appears in the sky, people wonder about rain on the track. If a horse shies, people wonder whether he'll shy as the barrier goes up. I think that much of what's happening in the world these recent days is being scanned anxiously by British eyes, not for itself, but for its effects on the great race, the entry of the Allied armies into Europe. All thinking is dominated by the concrete fact that on some unknown day, the whole strength of the American and British armies is going to be at grips with the German army. And in the military and diplomatic signs, observers here strain desperately to read the auguries of the future, the immediate future of battle and the more distant future of peace. Take the casino bombing for one instance. Heavy bombers were shifted to work that had usually been considered in the province of the medium bombers. According to the theory that has been generally accepted, Commanders use heavy bombers to deliver crushing blows on big objectives, ports, cities, and factories far behind the enemy lines. To blast his defense positions, the low-flying, more accurate mediums are usually employed. At Casino, the long holdup had evidently decided the commanders to use extraordinary means. The heavy bombers roared out to dump their huge bomb loads on the whole area of the German defenses. British papers gave big headlines to the exploit, and many thousands of words of eyewitness descriptions were published. But the results were evidently unsatisfactory, for after it was all over, Allied infantrymen were still fighting their way through Casino. German defenders had crouched in their dugouts. Bomb craters and debris helped hold up the attackers. And those Germans who weren't killed popped up to give Allied infantry their same old job, the hardest job in war bar none, walking up to enemy machine gun posts and putting them out of action. Now, the average Britisher has become something of a military tactician. And the question he's asking today is, what does the casino bombing prove that will help the second front? Probably it proves what's been proved before. That in spite of all the high explosive and the loud noises, bombing by itself is not enough to knock out determined infantry in good defensive positions. And the stories from casino of artillery and anti-tank guns sliding out of the mouths of caves to fire, then sliding back before they can be hit, recall vividly the caves on the cliff face at Dieppe and the German 75s that slid out, fired, and slid back. 
Casino's problem is one that will obviously have to be mastered as a necessary first step into Europe. Without being a prophet, anyone who's ever seen German defenses knows they'll be well-constructed and well-sighted. We can be sure that the Germans will fight desperately. But we know also that once they're convinced they're cut off and beaten, they'll surrender quickly. Like the rolling artillery barrage in this or the last war, the problem of aiding by bomb or shell your most important soldier, the infantryman, is largely one of timing. Intrepid and well-trained infantrymen with confidence in their gunners can work closely behind a creeping barrage of artillery fire that for a brief space of time keeps enemy defenders down in their dugouts. But if too many minutes elapse between the barrage that rains on the defense posts and the moment the infantryman can toss his grenade into the machine gun crew, the Germans can raise their heads and start firing with disastrous results. Casino seems to prove that infantry can't work very closely behind the bombs from high-flying heavy bombers, which are accurate only for an area. That's something that will have to be taken into account. But the heavy bombers are doing other work, great work, that inspires the British with confidence in the coming offensive. The huge smashes by day and night, like today, against German cities. The fact that heavy bombers can now attack Germany from Italian bases and a great air pincer have given rise to the hope that when our armies do move, they will at least have the advantage of air cover. And air cover, if not all important to battle-hardened soldiers, is extremely important to troops going into their first action. With air cover, an army can move faster than without air cover. And speed is going to be the factor that will win or lose many battles in the days to come. And the British feel that the heavy bombing of Germany will squeeze off the flow of supplies available for German armies in both east and west. And perhaps it's good insurance for future peace to blast into the German mentality that they can't henceforth make war without paying the penalty on their own soil. There are other recent developments that have been looked upon here for their future rather than their present effect. Slight diplomatic incidents through these past weeks have convinced most serious observers here that there's a lack of cohesion in the diplomatic activity of the three larger allies, America, Russia, and Britain. You get the feeling here that Washington has recently taken unilateral action in several diplomatic spheres to which the British have agreed, but later. The most immediate points that spring to mind are the Saudi Arabian oil scheme, the sudden statement on the Argentine affair, and finally the era decision. Then came Russia's announcement that an envoy was being accredited to Badoglio. Again, an example of unilateral action that's not important for itself, but for the future. Some sources here defend the Russian action on the ground that the Allied Control Commission had visited Italy only once or twice and had done little or nothing to help or hinder the straightening out of the involved Italian political situation. It's explained that the Russians felt they could get both information and action from their own representative with Badoglio that wasn't possible through the Vega channels of the Control Commission. It seems incredible to observers here that in spite of all goodwill and the realization that the three countries must have more than a casual working partnership to achieve victory and maintain some sort of order between the nations, we still haven't reached the stage where we can work in close diplomatic harmony, the stage where we can sit down and plan things out together ahead of time. The trial of Cuchy, former Vichy Minister of the Interior, is another point that's been closely watched in Britain as a straw to indicate the future on the continent. It's been interesting to note that in the mixed British comments on the trial lies a failure to understand how deep is the political passion that governs continental thought. And in the trial of Pucher, we can see the coming trials of the German war chiefs and their quislings. They will be political trials, for as one London Review aptly said, how else can they be tried where the judges must decide without known laws to guide them what is crime and treason and what is not? One of Britain's ablest political writers reviewing the case anonymously in the left-wing tribune says, the head of Pucher is the warning symbol to all who doubt or fear it that those who would have led France and Europe into eternal slavery two or three years ago shall not regain their mastery. The hopes and dreams of the common people, no less than their justice, pronounce that verdict. So the British wonder what the trial of Pucher means as an indication of the greater trials and condemnations of the men who've been responsible for a world's suffering. For the word guilty, condemned to death, is a word that will be heard in many courts of many lands before Europe regains its freedom. Meanwhile, the Germans have been doing little to avert the coming blow. In their propaganda, observers can detect signs of growing uneasiness, signs that the combination of the big air raids, the worsening situation on the Russian front, and the tottering position of such satellite nations as Finland, Romania, and Bulgaria have impressed on the Germans that the clock has come to a late minute of the 11th hour. 
A few small raids on London make up Germany's only active retaliation. And that's not retaliation of a type to cause the slightest hindrance to the war effort. London's great bulk absorbs bombs without much trace. There's even some pride here that London is using up German planes that might otherwise be used against our invasion push. For most of the American troops in Britain, the recent London air raids have been the first real taste of war. Bombs, fires, and the anti-aircraft barrage have been something new. And thousands of Americans on leave in this British capital have gone out in the streets to watch the display. For the American military police, who control all American soldiers in London, the raids have been something of a headache. The military police in their bright white helmets and leggings have had to shepherd rubber-necking soldiers into shelters, fight fires, carry furniture out of burning houses, and help the British bobbies with street traffic. They've also treated casualties, cleared debris, along with their usual work of seeing that American soldiers don't get into trouble in the big city. A pretty big job. So today, I thought you might like to hear a couple of American military, military policemen and tell you about it themselves. They're Private Forrest Snyder of Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Private First Class Hollis E. Sutton of McMinnville, Tennessee. You did a little firefighting the other night, didn't you, Private Snyder? Yes. Some of the MPs worked in quite a few fires that night. I saw a little fire flame burning inside a room in a locked office building. I broke in and went up to the room. I used the three buckets of water I found on the floor, but I couldn't put it out. If I had help, had help at that moment, I think we could have saved the house. By the time I got some other soldiers, three floors were burning. It was too late. All we could do was to go in and save some of the furniture. And what did you do, Private Sutton? At one part, my job was to keep people moving, keep them away from the forest so the farmers could work. Burning pieces of building were falling all around, and I had a hard time keeping soldiers and the rest away from the danger area. Now, what other jobs do American MPs do in air raids? Just be ready to help the British civil defense workers any way we can. For instance, in our barracks, we have an emergency rescue squad always on duty. If the British rescue squad need extra help anywhere in our neighborhood, we have trained men ready to go. And what about your ordinary job? We tell soldiers how to get to where they want to go in London. We have special instructions on London streets, the places of interest, restaurants and Red Cross clubs. But in these London blackouts at night, it's not easy to find your way around, even for an MP. Say a soldier is causing trouble. How do you work with a regular London policeman? Bobbies can hold an American, American soldier, but not press charges against him. What happens is that the London policeman holds the man who is causing the trouble and gets in touch with us. We take him away and our own army authorities deal with him. Some of your men are on traffic work, aren't they? Yes. They take American convoys through the London area, check up on speeding and parking of American military vehicles, just like the ordinary police at home. We are deep of radios installed with Scotland Yard, and we can get a pickup to any scene of trouble within three minutes. And what other kinds of work do you do? We've had regular combat training with infantry weapons, as well as special courses in street fighting and judo. That's rough and tumble jujitsu. Back in the States, we had foreign language courses, so we know enough to run traffic and administer areas that the Army occupies. Incendiary bombs weren't exactly new because we had been trained at home on how to deal with them. We know something about first aid, too. You're almost jacks of all trades, aren't you? I suppose most of you were policemen in civil life, so you had something to begin on. Not at all. I was a machinist. Certainly was a farmer and nursery worker. In fact, I know of only one MP who used to be a policeman. And yet you have one of the toughest and most important police jobs in the world. I know from experience how vital will be the work of the MPs with our invasion force. I've seen them directing traffic under shell fire, pointing the way to headquarters and other points, keeping trucks and tanks moving so they don't form a target for enemy bombing, guarding prisoners, all in all, doing key work in the great task of keeping an army rolling ahead. And this Allied invasion army that's readying here will roll ahead in an amphibious attack that should occupy an important place in history. It'll be a new phase in Britain's military career. For hundreds of years, the British have preferred the roundabout method of small armies moving along sea lines of communication they control. And this coming attack will be far huger than anything America has ever known. But with experienced leaders, well-trained troops, and gigantic stocks of war materials, the outcome should not be in doubt, however high the price we pay. This is John McVeigh in London, returning you to the NBC Newsroom in New York. You have been listening to War Telescope. 
War Telescope is a weekly report on the war, seen from London by John McVane, NBC's veteran observer in the British capital. Mr. McVane is presented each Saturday at this same time over most of these stations. In addition to his regular weekly report, Mr. McVane today presented an interview with an American MP serving in England. War Telescope is a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. Remember to listen next Saturday at this same time over most of these stations to War Telescope. This is the National Broadcasting Company.